My name is Patrick McAllister, and uh, I work at the Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter at Habitat for Humanity. It's great to see everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I was really pleased to be here yesterday. It was such an interesting day for me, um, and I hope for you as well. Uh, today is going to be another interesting day. Yesterday, we focused a little bit more on the background of, of housing and housing in the economy. Today, I think we're going to focus a little bit more on how we actually get it done. So I think that's really going to be an interesting day. We have a very, very full um, set of panels. And so I want to encourage everybody to stay caffeinated and um, be prepared to ask questions at question time. Um, and we'll get through this uh, and hopefully come out at the other end with a new appreciation for the role of housing uh, in the economy. I did want to just mention that I'm also here representing uh, the Way Forward Coalition. You may have seen the logo up there. It's a re relatively new coalition um, that started after Mario Hochschmidt and Arthur A. Cullen and Richard Green wrote a paper um, called The Cornerstone of Recovery, focusing on how housing can be an important component to recovering from the pandemic. Um, and that led to a group of practitioners from multilateral development institutions, bilateral development institutions, the private sector, NGOs, all coming together to discuss how we could actually put that into practice. And in a way, that was the foundation for this conference because we also had the great benefit of getting the academic community with the practitioner community all together uh, and we, we came up with this conference uh, a couple of years later. So that was a great pleasure. Um, so, so that's what the Way Forward Housing Coalition is when you see that logo. And if anybody's interested, just speak to me or any of the other people in the room. Without further ado then, I think I'll ask uh, Siki Zhang to come up and introduce her first panel that's focusing on how to build a fair and efficient housing market. Good morning, everyone. It's my honor to be here. And just now we talk about color, and I feel so honored that I also share the same color with our uh, chair of the conference of the pink, uh, pink jacket. So we didn't discuss, we just synced automatically. <laughs> and uh, so uh, welcome to our, uh, this morning's first panel. So our uh, theme of this panel is about how to build a fair and efficient housing market. So we have uh, three panelists, later I will introduce them. But I just want to first give you a big picture and an overview of what we are gonna talk about. So basically, Today, uh, as just now Patrick mentioned, we are going to talk into the details and how to implement uh, the right housing policies. And uh, so for our perspective for this panel will be this, um, this uh, 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 efficiency and the fairness. So but first of all, let's think about the efficiency and the equity and all the economists they are talking about this together with policy makers. And as you know that efficiency is if we look at this pie, this pie, so the efficiency is how to make a bigger pie. So that's, uh, we, we know this efficiency. And then the second step is how to share. If we have a bigger pie, then how to share the pie with an uh, uh, equitable way. So which one will get how much, how big uh, a slice. So that's a, a basic understanding of the, of the trade-offs between the efficiency and the equity. And think about this, um, so since I have done a lot of work in China, the China's housing market, so at first, if the market didn't work, for example, be, before 1980s, before 1990s, there was no housing market at all, all the central planning and the central allocation of housing. So, and then all the public sectors, they run out of uh, resources uh, to build houses, that it was a very severe housing shortage. And then at that time, no market, no efficiency at all. The pie was very small, and uh, it's a, 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 a very big problem of this uh, housing shortage. I think yesterday I already said some numbers saying that in Shanghai, uh, per square, like six, six square, square meters per person at that time, very overcrowded, that's a big problem. And then later they established the housing market, and using market approach instead of central planning approach, 
And then over the 20, 30 years, then it, they achieved a lot of efficiencies in the market and uh, made a much bigger pie. And then in Shanghai, per, uh, it's about uh, 20 or 25 uh, square, square uh, meters per person. Because all these market supply side developers, they were so active and they were incentivized to provide a lot of housing. So that become a bigger pie. However, then you, 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 you then uh, come to this equity problem. Who will get houses? The low income, high income people, whether, whether they have an um, equitable share of the slice. And, and also the urban and the rural migrants and the urban people, that all the conversations then became a big problem later about housing affordability. So that's an equity issue. But I just want to highlight the equity and the fairness slightly different because we are now talking about fairness in our panel. I cite uh, from uh, Steve Malpazy, Professor Steve, I got some, uh, some information and knowledge from you. So for the equity, we always can measure or talk. Vertical, horizontal uh, equity, uh, all the concepts. But fairness, I think it's uh, like more like from different perspectives. So the fairness basically is an action or a location of resources is fair if most of the people, most of people in the game, all the stakeholders, they agree to it before coming into this location, before coming into the game. So that's the fairness. So everyone feels fear for this location. It feels fair. That means a little bit more um, subjective and depending on this person's perspective, this group's perspective. That's why this person feels this fear, but that person might not feel this is fear uh, arrangement. That depending on these uh, perspectives. So that's also the focus of today's uh, conversation. And we know we cannot only focus on efficiency because it's very hard for the real estate, for the housing, for the urban development to be purely like uh, Pareto optimal. optimal. For example, if you only consider efficiency, and uh, it's very hard to, to have everyone, another person, to better off without sacrificing the, the, the other ones uh, become uh, worse off. Think about this uh, urban renewal. Urban renewal in the cities, and then you have at first maybe some poor people and the slums here, and the informal housing. And this so valuable location, you see we talk a lot about this a lot. And then you, 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 this value, this uh, land value that triggers the new development, then you have to relocate, re relocate those people. And they, some of them, they were unhappy because from their perspective, it's unfair, right? It's unfair. Um, and then how to do this? So there's a lot of discussion. So I'm not going to dive into this, but I think this will be a lot of discussion here today in our panel. So for, to, to look at efficiency and fairness, we want to have an angle to our session. So our angle, I feel like after we, we four, uh, three panelists and us, we discussed. And then we, we think basically our angle will be the structural issues, the structural constraints, the structural barriers in this very dynamic structural trans transformation time. All the things are happening right now simultaneously. It's a structural change, especially for those areas with very fast urbanization and it's this currently the globalization and the political tension and all those uh, dynamics. And in this fast changing and the dynamic time, what are the structural barriers for efficiency and uh, also the fairness? So as you can see, our panelists, we are very global and we have Africa, North America and Asia. And then, you know, later you will find out we have some similarities in the topics, but also differences. It's, of course, it's not a one size fits all. And then we, but how, so you, you later will find out for four of us, especially the three panelists, they share the, the, this, all these common, common perspectives to look at this, to look at this issue. Holistic approach. We cannot just isolate housing. We need to take a holistic approach to think about the housing and the macroeconomy and the dynamic view, not static, dynamic. And then we look at this, all these different uh, structural issues from different dimensions, like the economy and, uh, and also the housing sector. So that's, I think, also the theme of the entire our conference. So how about the, but yesterday we talked a lot about skill, the skill of the 
the size or the scale of the, of the housing sector. Today, we kind of more into the structural inside and the composition effect. But we understand the composition effect, first level, first order is the economy and the housing, whether it's a misallocation uh, between the economy and the housing, and how, what, how, to, how to understand the contribution of the housing sector to the microeconomy. And uh, then we have all this income, wealth, race, ethnicity, and the local versus migrants, especially in the urbanization uh, contact. And the formal and the informal, you see we already touched on a lot on this. And also finally will be, because we talk about different perspectives, the fairness, then whether you think fairness only think about you or the people similar to you, like your communities, or you also think about others who are different from you, other cities, other communities. So that will, will be related to these um, different layers, central government, federal government, and the regional, and the city, and the community, the tension between those layers. Then that comes to our stories. I will take this opportunity to introduce uh, our panelists. So we will start from uh, Mohammed, and he will talk about this in Africa, this uh, very structural dynamic tra transformation time, how to use a holistic view to tackle these different issues and barriers. And then followed by, by Jay. So I just want to say that Mohammed is a manager of the policy, research, and partnerships Shelter Africa. And then followed by Professor G. San Idol. And he's a professor, chair professor of business, finance, and real estate in the University of Iowa. And he will also focus on Africa. And uh, we will talk about this housing supply chain, also a holistic and systematic will to understand the current big problem of unfinished housing, this problem challenge in Africa, and how to resolve that issue. And Mike will follow. Mike is a chair of Urban Planning Faculty Executive Committee and Associate Professor of Urban Planning at UCLA, Laskin School of Public Affairs. And he will talk United States, and especially, uh, I think, uh, California, use an example to talk about the people like, like us and the people different from us, how to understand the fairness between those two, and the tension uh, between the state and the local communities in many aspects. And then if we still have time, I will add on uh, Mike's perspective well from the China uh, story about this, uh, these issues. So then with all this introduction, I will pass on to Mohammed for the first story. Please. Okay. So each one, you will have 10 minutes. I will try to control the time. OK. Uh, thank you, Tsiki, uh, for the introduction. Uh, good morning. Um, I would like to yeah, kickstart the discussion from my perspective in terms of the efficiency and also the fairness, just as uh, the, the moderator indicated, and also what needs to be done to have a holistic view of the practices of housing delivery in Africa. So um, the presentation? OK. Um, a lot has been said already since yesterday in terms of uh, the rate of urbanization in Africa, in terms of uh, the housing deficit, in terms of what needs to be done, uh, more specifically relating to examples from Dar es Salaam and also Nairobi. But the challenge cuts across the whole region, not only East Africa, but of course West Africa, uh, North Africa, but of course with diverse issues and challenges. It's not the challenge, it's not one size fits all uh, solutions requirement and also needs to kind of have a holistic view of the issues. So um, the organization, well aware, Africa is facing the most rapidly growing organization almost globally. But of course, what are the numbers that speaks to the organization rate? As indicated here in the slide, we can have countries from Kenya ranging to estimated around 2 million, Nigeria 22 million, Tanzania 3 million. So that's a deficit. And this deficit is ever growing by the day. And then, of course, one of other factors that we need to consider um, is that yesterday we talked about the elephant in the room, housing being the elephant in the room, in terms of if you want to enhance economic recovery, you want to enhance job creation, housing is the key factor. But another angle to it is that the connection between housing and the SDGs, 
We all see housing as SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. But the fact is that housing delivery cuts across the 17 goals of SDGs. If you can give housing that priority, it's not only SDG 11, you're attending to climate action by building green buildings, green, green homes. You're also attending to partnerships through PPP and also uh, related uh, in initiatives. You're talking to uh, innovation and infrastructure. You're talking to enhanced you know, uh, gender empowerment. So. That really talks about the relevance of housing cutting across the whole goals of sustainable development. So, and then within the African context, there is the Agenda 2063, which is championed by the African Union Commission. It aims to, uh, by year 2063, Africa to be prosperous, to achieve its goals of uh, development, social, economically. Part of it, housing is a core mandate. So really that adds to the whole discussion on not only elephant in the room, but it's a priority more focus needs to be given to housing. And we have seen it, the COVID-19 pandemic from 2020, 2021. Yesterday we had the glimpse of uh, Kibra, which is Kibra from where I live is just uh, less than five kilometers. So that really talks to, you know, how it kind of, I'm within, you know, the, 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 the inner core of Nairobi, but within the fringes, less than five kilometers, you, there is a slum. So that, and, and we've seen the impact. If you are talking about social distancing, you are talking about uh, quarantine, how can you be able to do that in the slum? How can you be able to do that in, in a structure that is built with corrugated sheet? So that is the reality. And the, the pandemics, well, we really have to find a way of, it's, 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 it's something that in the future, there's a possibility of such issues coming up. And housing is a core component of attending to these issues. So that, that really kind of not only being the elephant in the room, but it's a necessity. And I always say that governments need to give housing, not only lip service, no, they need to give it priority, topmost priority. But of course, not only the government can do that, there has to be a multi-collaborative approach from the private sector, from the academia to come together because no single institution can do it alone. And more importantly, we're in the decade of action. SDG 2030 is just seven, eight years from now. So, and, 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 and I, I think it's all a matter of action we need to deliver those homes because more and more people are in need of these homes and there is a need for us to be proactive, hands-on and practical. So um, having talked about the COVID-19 pandemic, the SDGs and all those correlated uh, aspects, then the other aspect is that of the building the fair and efficient market uh, uh, in Africa. It needs to be holistic, it needs to be comprehensive, you need to cut across the whole housing value chain. And that is why, because of the value chain nature of housing, also talks to the impact of housing, not only on sustainable cities and communities, but also building uh, economies, enhancing uh, health outcomes, and so on. So factors to consider in terms of building efficient and uh, fair markets in Africa in terms of housing is, first, uh, for me, I take affordability to be very, very important. Affordability is key. For us, that Africa, the, the thing is that you might build the homes, yes, but just as uh, the, the, my, my colleague, the other Professor G, who also talked about you know, having ghost towns from Luanda to, to, to Abuja in Nigeria. There are ghost towns there, they are delivered, but the uptake is not there. What is the challenge is affordability. We only look at it previously, the, the notion is that, okay, if you are servicing your mortgage or you are paying rent with anything more than 30% of your earnings, then it's not affordable. That has been the, 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 the discussion, or let me say the understanding, but we don't look at it from the larger perspective. What are you spending on housing, uh, on transportation? What are you spending on other basic needs? The housing itself might be affordable, but by the time you factor in uh, transportation costs to take you to the CBD, where the opportunities are, then it's no more affordable. So there is an initiative which we partnered with, uh, with CAF uh, through Keisha and her team to develop housing affordability calculator. Because we looked at it is that the factor of housing affordability, that's the first core mandate of what needs to be understood. Most specifically as Shelter Africa being a DFI, we have to deliver the homes, that's our impact. But then affordability targeting always remains a challenge. So the, the, the calculator, which is of course available uh, on, on, on the portal, uh, from the Shelter Africa portal, also the Center for Affordable Housing Finance Africa portal, it looks into affordability not only at the what a household earns, but also looking at it what is feasible 
for the developer because we have to look at it from both perspectives. If it's, 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 it's affordable to the household in terms of earning, then is it feasible? They are considering market cons uh, factors. More specifically now, that with the inflationary pressures across African markets, it's quite disturbing. It's an issue from all the regions that you can't, I, this is something personal that I had that experience. I asked someone to give me a quotation. That was around February this year. It's, it's, a, it's a quantity surveyor, but he opened up to, to me that it's not possible. He asked me, okay, am I going for the, for the, for the project in the, within the next two weeks or so? I said, no, 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 definitely no, but I just need an idea of a budget. He said, it's not doable because the inflation is quite disturbing. By the time he gives a quotation and you come back by the following week or two, maximum two weeks, then it's, it's, it's something different. Then also, same, similar scenario from Dar es Salaam. So that kind of prompted the, the situation that really inflation is affecting the cost of materials, more specifically in Africa, that majority of the building materials are imported from the doors to uh, tiles, painting, almost every part of the building is imported. And coupled with the fact that there were uh, issues relating to uh, logistics from COVID pandemic, and then coupled with the, 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 the restrictions, the inflationary pressures from the building materials. So affordability is important. And, and the way we looked at it is that, of course, um, um, the, the targeting of the affordability is important. Once you have an idea of affordability from the household perspective, also the, the developer perspective, that will go a long way in enhancing uh, housing delivery. And also another aspect is that of um, which I won't really delve much because a lot has been said, is uh, the, 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 it needs to be holistic, the approach of housing delivery. It needs to be, you need to consider not only new housing construction, but also incremental, also slum upgrading. Because in some, more specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the buy, if you only focus on building new homes, you're not giving consideration to slum upgrading, then it doesn't balance. So they have to go hand in hand. And of course, it, that will enhance the equitability and also the fairness that we are trying to portray in this presentation. And also, facilitation to land. That talks to, more of it has been discussed yesterday by the keynote speaker, in terms of land reforms, in terms of titling. That's very, very important. That's, that's key, because without it, we're just kind of uh, you know, talking about an idea, but the building blocks are not there. So that continues to limit the opportunities in the market. Other aspects, of course, relating to improving access to mortgage finance. That's important, but at the same time, that has always been said over the years. And what has been the effect? Mortgage to GDP ratio across African countries is, is low, very, very low. If you take out probably South Africa with some pockets of other countries, it's, it, it's an issue. And of course, countries across Africa are doing more in terms of creating mortgage finance companies, but the reality is that, is that we can't only focus on mortgage finance because the majority of those that are in need of, of, of housing, that first unit, are in the informal sector and they don't have the requirements to qualify for a mortgage. So that means the core component of, the, of, of those that are in need of homes are not captured because the focus has always been a mortgage, mortgage, mortgage. So it needs to be balanced, not only focusing on mortgage finance, but also aspect like rental housing, aspect relating to you know, catering for those that are in the informal sector, microfinance. So all these are issues that over time have been there, but of course more needs to be done. So, so, so more specifically, rental housing is an initiative that will go a long way, more specifically relating to the, the demography of African youths nowadays. Are, the mobility is high. They don't really want to pin themselves down to a particular town or particular city. They are on the move. So committing to a mortgage 15, 20 years might be a challenge. So that's an area that needs to be given due consideration in order to enhance a fair and equitable housing market in Africa. So next slide here is talking about, you know, of course it's not all doom in terms of uh, challenge of housing in Africa. There has been movement, there has been some success stories across African countries, which I believe the most important part of it is for countries in Africa to learn from each other. It's very, very important. Lessons learned. How have you been able to do it? What was the stakeholder engagement? What was the role of the government, the public sector, the CSOs? And then how can we be able to really come together because no single institution can do it alone. So that is why talking to each other is very, very important. And also not to talk in silos. First and foremost is the, the efforts by uh, Kenya. 
in terms of uh, enhancing uh, not only green buildings, but green bonds and also student accommodation through the use of a capital market. It's, 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 it has been a kind of a game changer because they've been able to do it. Student accommodation has always been a challenge. The public institutions are there, the private institutions are there, but the, 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 the uh, accommodation for students, it, it becomes a kind of a crisis. And not only Kenya, but across African countries. But in Kenya, they'll be able to do it in terms of you know, the, bringing in the capital market to catalyze funding to enhance student accommodation. So I think that really kind of has set the pace for other countries to learn. Um, also, Morocco, the Cities Without Slums Initiative, which is globally acclaimed, despite, okay, fine, there have been challenges here and there, but largely we can say it has been a success. They have been able to really make a tremendous kind of effort in terms of clearing slums and building new homes. So what are the lessons learned? And also, how can African countries you know, learn and imbibe these initiatives going forward? And also other countries like Tanzania, Nigeria, the uh, Francophone West Africa Zone setting up various mortgage finance companies from TMRH in, uh, in, in, in Tanzania, KMRC from, from Kenya. So really, it's, uh, and all these initiatives started less than 10 years ago. So this, uh, I believe, there is an effort made, but more needs to be done. And then talking about the way forward, of course, I've already talked about you know, the aspect of uh, inflation, the aspect of supply chain disruption. These are the emerging issues, emerging challenges that we need to cope with and also aspect of uh, regional integration and industrialization. More specifically in Africa now, talking about the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement is expected to be a game changer. So what is the role of housing? How can we be able to enhance industrialization within the space of regional integration? So all these are aspects that needs to be you know, more dis discussed further and practitioners, policymakers to brainstorm on how to enhance all these uh, ideas going forward. Imagine technologies that are coming up. Just, and the, the picture there is, is a 3D house which was built in, 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 in the outskirts of Nairobi. All these emerging technologies that can be scaled up. But of course, we have to understand the lessons learned. So uh, wrapping up, just to give an overview as I'm concluding, uh, the institution that I do represent, that's Shelter Africa, what do we do? And uh, our project and services. Shelter Africa is a pan-African housing finance institution with the sole mandate of providing housing solutions across Africa. Uh, have member countries across 45 African uh, member states and also with uh, institutions like African Development Bank, African insurance and shareholders. And then, of course, the process of Shelter Africa, they cut across not only the demand side, but also the supply side. That's a holistic approach that I mentioned earlier, because you can't only focus on lines of credit to, 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 uh, to institutions. You have to focus on project financing and also all those initiatives. So all these are important to enhance the housing delivery uh, space. And of course, one other key area that uh, as I'm concluding is that of um, sustainability, which you have made that uh, mandate uh, to be a core kind of uh, area of consideration for us. We have this uh, collaboration with EDGE to enhance green buildings across Africa. But the question remains, and also looking forward to engaging further in this discussion, is that can you go green at the same time affordable? That, uh, that's something that needs to be considered. Because in Africa, really, affordability is a, is a challenge. And then we want to be sustainable, we want to go green. So how can you be able to balance these two? So, of course, it needs you know, more collaboration, more hands-on practical solutions, which I believe all this will go a long way in enabling Africa to achieve its set goals in terms of housing delivery and largely in the goals of social and economic development. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. So when I first came to Wisconsin uh, to do my uh, MBA and PhD, I guess uh, that's when I was uh, sort of rebaptized and named Jay, and it has stayed you know, well with me you know, well since then. Uh, but I've managed uh, to uh, continue to maintain uh, uh, contact uh, with uh, my country of birth, Ghana, and the rest of uh, the African uh, continent. Uh, previously, I've worked in the world with uh, the World Bank to help uh, establish uh, the stock exchange in Ghana. We also work with uh, World Bank to establish the first housing financial uh, company in you know, uh, Ghana. Uh, indeed, I've worked, uh, I've consulted with uh, Shelter Africa. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, one phenomenon 
uh, that sort of exemplified what I call sort of the failure of uh, the system to deliver housing across the continent, in particular sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So first, some quick uh, factoid. Number one, we all know that uh, Africa, especially south of uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, is uh, undergoing a burgeoning demographic shift. Okay? And that demographic shift is also accompanied by rapid uh, urbanization. And uh, it is said that Africa is urbanizing at a rate faster than any part of you know, the world, roughly about 3.5% annually. The population of Africa currently a little bit more than a billion is expected to double by 2050. Okay. So if you look at additional facts on the ground, there is a severe shortage of housing, in particular affordable uh, housing. Infrastructure, urban planning, these are all woefully inadequate. Okay. It is estimated you know, uh, that uh, currently the backlog in the housing deficit is about 50 million units. Okay. And one estimate that I've seen uh, says that it will cost in excess of uh, $2 trillion to eliminate this deficit over a 10-year you know, uh, period. Okay. Now, for me also, one particular manifestation that has stayed with me since I came you know, uh, to the U.S. I've been in the U.S. You know, uh, now for going to about 40 you know, uh, years. But as I said, I've maintained contact uh, with uh, the uh, continent. It is this phenomenon of unfinished buildings. You go across the sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Accra, Ghana, where I was born you know, uh, in Raj. My first trip outside uh, West Africa to Kenya, to Tanzania, back to West Africa, in Dakar, Lagos, everywhere you go, you see this phenomena of unfinished of our buildings. Anywhere from uh, just uh, the foundation, or sometimes up to a lentil. No windows in know why yet. No one uh, living in a while. And basically what you have here is capital that initially had been uh, converted into blocks and mortar, okay. but going nowhere. In fact, you can think of uh, that uh, a phenomenon as largely capital that is lying fallow. It's going you know, uh, nowhere, it is subject to erosion, it is subject uh, to you know, uh, uh, destruction. And indeed, one uh, estimate also that I have seen is that if you were to accumulate, you go around uh, all the uh, sub-Saharan African you know, countries and calculate you know, what the value of this is a big chunk of uh, the uh, GDP of the continent. As a result, this phenomenon has denied uh, the existence of the normal linkages that we see, both backward linkages and forward linkages with the rest of the economy in order to spur economic you know, uh, development. Okay? So why is this you know, uh, happening? I think the way that uh, I like to think about it is in terms of this uh, Venn diagram, uh, five systems that in my view, and I think in the view of you know, many, ought to intersect in order for there to be an efficient, equitable, and a more inclusive delivery of you know, housing. But it's not you know, happening. Okay. So think first of uh, the uh, property rights market. Okay. It is really in shambles. You take Ghana, for example, you have uh, the system where a big chunk of the land is vested, the fee simple is vested in the government. Okay. And also the uh, customary 
land tenure part, the part of land that is controlled by various you know, tribes across and over the country, and in some cases even you know uh, families. And these lands had been you know uh, allocated in a very very haphazard you know uh, way where. In some cases, or in a lot of cases, actually, households are compelled to start, you know, a building not because they can finish it, but just to secure the land. Okay, and uh, you can see houses that are at the foundation stage or the lentil, you know, stage that have been there for more than 20, you know, years. And my sense is that it will never, you know, finish. So, so therefore, the normal linkage that should connect the housing production in the world sector and the rest of the economy is as best you know, or not you know, uh, there. Quite apart from the fact that there is this backlog of, of houses that needed you know, uh, to be you know, uh, built. So uh, first and foremost, I think we have to go back and look at uh, the land tenure you know, uh, system okay, to try and resolve that conversation get a more clearer and enhanced uh, property you know, uh, rights, okay? So that those who own you know, our land and want to build, but they are not ready because of absence you know, of capital, that capital could be deployed you know, uh, elsewhere for those who are ready you know, uh, uh, to build, okay? Now, the lack of uh, clearer you know, title is also impacting the housing finance you know, uh, market because it tends to basically erode the collateral value of uh, the uh, property. In absence, you know, uh, that interest rates are quite high on mortgages, okay? And uh, banks are reluctant to get into the housing you know, uh, sector. So this uh, vicious cycle you know, uh, uh, continues. Okay? If you look at it also on the supply side of uh, the housing you know, uh, market, there is also a lack of funding liquidity. Okay? A lot of developers do not have construction you know, uh, alone that they can move from A you know, uh, to Z. I believe you know, that every developer, once they cut short, they should be able to complete that house in no time. But Largely, that is not you know, existent. And also, if you look at it in terms of the consumption in you know, our sector, right? Uh, the typical household, if you look at uh, what the normal capital structure should be in order for them to afford housing, it typically should consist of uh, some equity down payment, and then the mortgage sector will, uh, kicks in. But that, you know, uh, also is a real, you know, uh, challenge. So, uh, as Mohammed, you know, was said, a lot of effort has been put into really trying to deepen the mortgage, you know, uh, market. We have regular banks. We have uh, those, you know, uh, bank that specialize in housing. We have even microfinance, you know, uh, companies that are also specializing, you know, uh, in housing. But it is still the case, you know, uh, that. Uh, Africa has not, you know, been able in a very dedicated, you know, way to deliver uh, housing. Moving on, also taking you know, into account the again the production uh, sector. My sense, you know, is that the production sector will need to be industrialized within the continent. If you think of uh, uh, housing, what comes to mind is it must be cement, brick, and mortar. Forget about fabricated you know, uh, housing. People think that fabricated housing is sub, you know, uh, 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 standard. So as a result, when you put all of this you know, uh, uh, together, and on top of this, you add the fact that uh, the uh, infrastructure is woefully, woefully you know, uh, in, in our adequate. We still talk about affordable housing, but we are really yet to see affordable you know, uh, housing in terms of the volume that will really make a dent uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to at least get in the way of solving this conundrum that we see across the African you know, continent. 
So my sense is that what needed in a while to be done was a strong need for political leadership. First starting uh, within the land tenure you know, uh, system to get that you know, uh, uh, right. right. That perhaps will reduce the likelihood that people who are not actually ready will jump in and want to uh, build for the purposes of securing titles in order to the land. Secondly, if that is done, perhaps that will encourage you know, uh, the banks to want to get more seriously in terms of providing mortgage or financing because that will help in terms of improving the collateral you know, uh, 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 value. So bottom line, if you look at it, if you look at it in the context of the issue of our system, at this you know, uh, point, I will say that some elements of the system you know, uh, are there, but they are not you know, uh, connected. They are not really working in a holistic way to be able to deliver, you know, because we have been, you know, at this for many, many, you know, months, you know, now, and uh, some have argued, you know, that perhaps uh, one other hidden reason is that Africa may be urbanizing too early and too fast. And as a result, if you think about it in terms of international capital flow, why is it that uh, we do not see substantial capital flowing from the rich Nova you know, uh, country to the African you know, uh, uh, countries? Well, I think that is a huge you know, uh, uh, issue. My sense you know, uh, uh, is that uh, if the environment continue to look very risky, I think it's going to scare uh, capital. You know, uh, but I believe you know, uh, that if we could get back to get in the system, you know, uh, all right, to get these five key systems to work together, because they feed into each other, okay, perhaps we'll start uh, the, uh, making some headway in terms of delivering uh, housing across sub-Saharan, you know, it is a very, very serious, you know, problem. This phenomena of uncompleted, you know, housing, I think I was aware of it before I left, you know, Ghana, and I keep going, you know, back and keep saying houses, you know, that got started at the foundation, you know, level, basically when I was in high school, they're still there at that, you know, stage, as I said, basically, Capital that is fallow, subject to erosion, and in my view, ultimately subject to destruction. And it's getting in, a, uh, in the way in terms of our ability to uh, uh, deliver. So again, uh, the big you know, uh, picture. I think we need to go back to think seriously about these five systems, okay? How we could get the five systems to work in a while together. Okay. How do we solve the land tenure you know, problem? Okay. How will that you know, connect with the mortgage you know, sector, both on the supply side as well as on the demand you know, side? How do we get to deliver appropriate infra you know, structure that will help connect the housing in a sector, if you think about it as a, a factory, right? Giving household you know, access to better you know, schools, better you know, our job, other you know, our amenities that go on to make a community a community. I mean, otherwise, the slums will continue because people need to live you know, elsewhere. So let's go back to the basics. We have not, in my view, uh, really delivered you know, our day yet. I'm quite you know, amazed at some of uh, the points that uh, Mohammed has enumerated in terms of uh, um, efforts you know, uh, to get uh, at least the mortgage you know, uh, market you know, uh, going. But so long as there's this huge disarray in the property you know, uh, market, I think. Uh, the, the ability to create more depth 
in the mortgage in our uh, market will continue to be uh, a challenge. The ability to have the cities uh, take advantage of the houses that are in, uh, in place in terms of their value. For example, currently, you see, you go to, uh, those of you who have been you know, uh, to Accra, one fashionable you know, uh, area is you know, uh, Legon. You see a lot of first class you know, uh, houses, but the city has not been able to monetize this in terms of uh, property taxes. The lack of property taxes also uh, affect the ability of uh, the city to afford or provide basic you know, amenities that will further enhance you know, the housing you know, uh, uh, environment towards a proper delivery of uh, housing that is more efficiently delivered, more equitable, and more equitable. I work mostly in California, which is not an emerging market. Um, but I think that uh, what's happened in California has, can shed some light on this question of how to have both a fair and efficient housing market, because right now California has neither. Um, it, it used to be much more efficient and much more fair, and never perfectly so, um, but right now it's, it's gone terribly off the rails, and I won't show you any numbers or anything, I have no slides, uh, but the inefficiency comes from the fact that California stopped building housing. Uh, that basically, if you look at its GDP growth from 1990 forward, it's been a pretty sustained economic boom. And a, particularly on the coast, if you look at it from a historical perspective, uh, it has permitted new housing and during that time like it's been in a terrible recession. Right? And so um, we have this, that's an inefficiency. You have very high demand and, and very low levels of new supply. But the obstacle to solving that has rarely really been this question of fairness. Uh, and, and the reason for that is not because uh, efficiency is unimportant, it's very important, but because efficiency is much easier to agree on than fairness is. Which is to say there's, there's a few different definitions of efficiency out there, but they kind of overlap and not too many, but fairness really is in the eye of the beholder. And you know, so one way to think about this is that efficiency has not been the subject of a thousand years of philosophy seminars that have made no progress, and fairness has, right? Um, and, and the reason for that, in part, is that unlike efficiency, we are all, with the case of efficiency, humans are born with a very powerful ingrained sense of fairness, right? Small children will become incredibly indignant from a very young age at, at things they perceive as unfair in a way they will not get upset if something inefficient happens in front of them. <laughs> and, the, and the problem with that, right, is that our sense of fairness that we're hardwired with is not cosmopolitan. Right? It, it's re we are really hardwired to look out, first of all, for ourselves and then for the, the people that we sort of most immediately identify with. Um, and that, that sort of, that approximation is bounded both spatially and temporally, right? Which is why this starts to matter a lot for housing. That, that we care about sort of people in our immediate surroundings. We care deeply about what our immediate surroundings look like. Uh, we discount people who are further away spatially and we discount people who are further away temporally, right? We really discount future people. Uh, and that's a problem because housing is a very long-lived good. And as, as William McCaskill likes to say, the future is actually where most people live. Right? And so, so the point I want to make, and, and I think California really is an example of this, is that when we structure the governance and regulation of housing in a manner that reinforces rather than pushes back against this bias that all of us have, um, things go very, very wrong. Right? And so I, I spend a lot of time. Uh, talking to, to people who are the, the primarily responsible for California's housing crisis, which is to say everyday Californians who don't want their neighborhoods to change. Right? There's been a lot of hunting for villains in the housing crisis, but at the root of it is just that. Um, and sometimes the, 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 what they express um, is, as I think uh, was, was mentioned yesterday, sometimes they have these concerns that are expressed which are just sort of like nice ways of masking classism or racism or things like that. That's out there for sure, but oftentimes their concerns are just very sincere, um, and they just think it's deeply unfair that someone would come in and take the, this environment that they bought into and invested a lot of time and money and make it look different, right? That this, this street of single family homes might become apartments or something like that. And they resent, you know, sort of the, the idea that a developer would come in and spend a bunch of money and lobby the city council and get some housing built. Um, and I am, not that sympathetic. I'm, I'm a renter in California. We, we need a lot more housing. But at the same time, and, and you know, from my perspective, the developer's money is a, a, the only way, right, that, that future residents can speak in a, in a given jurisdiction.
right? They, because future people can't vote. Um, but at the same time, um, I, I don't make a lot of progress trying to persuade people of that, right? Because it, again, you're sort of pushing against these sort of ingrained biases. Um, and, and I think that's the, as an academic, I have the, the, the sort of, it, it won't die desire to believe that I can just sort of like talk people out of anything. Um, it's not true. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you, you know, you do spend a lot of time trying to, to convince people that, that policy can be positive some and that we can all gain and so forth. Um, and, and oftentimes that is true. That's the nice thing about policy is that sometimes it can be positive some. Uh, and so we marshal all this evidence, and the evidence gets better and better. Um, and I think the other, the other limit to, to academic evidence in policy discourse is that, uh, as my family likes to tell me, um, oftentimes academics spend a lot of time just proving to themselves things everybody already knew, right? And so like, we, we, like a, 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 a series of great studies came out of primarily Harvard in the last few years, this moving to opportunity data, tax data, Raj Chetty used, showing that you know, if you did the zip code you live in really just has this powerful causal impact on life chances and so forth. And that was you know, kind of a, a, a really good sort of reaffirmation of something a lot of social scientists long suspected. Um, and, and not new, right, to, to anyone, right? I mean, if you, took the, all that, if you took all that stuff and drove out of Cambridge to Weston, Massachusetts and said like, oh, you know, you, you get a lot of advantages from being in this zip code, they would be like, yes. That's, that's why I bought a house here. And that's why it costs a lot of money. Um, and so if you tried to explain to them, well, you know, if we, if we built some more housing here, that, all those advantages could be shared. Um, the, the, the problem you would run into is that even if they bought into the fact that these absolute advantages could be shared, right, which is to say, like, it, there's lower pollution, there's, there's lower crime rates and things like that, I think one thing we sometimes miss is that a lot of the competition we see in housing markets is, is over relative status, right? That, that a lot of, you know, I'm going to sound a little bit cynical, but a lot of people want their kids to go to a good school not because um, they're going to learn what the capital of Belgium is, right? It's because they're going to get a leg up when they apply to Yale. And there's only so much Yale to go around, right? Like relative status is, is a huge part of our housing markets. And, and you can't, that, that is zero sum, right? There's only 10% there's only that can be in the top 10% of schools. And so what, what this is getting toward is I think that there's only so much sort of persuasion we can do. Um, and, and I think we've learned that in California as well, because we have deployed a lot of evidence over the last 20 years trying to convince Californians to allow, allow more housing to be built. And it doesn't really get anywhere. And it doesn't even change sort of the sincerely held belief that if someone was to build housing, um, it, it would be deeply unfair to the, to the people in the places where it's being built. And so I think, you know, sort of uh, Emil was talking yesterday about how he wished that, that uh, the, 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 the people who, who oversee housing in California, the elected officials, would sometimes be brave um, and just sort of let it be built even if it cost them their job. Um, I, I wish that too, but it's not a realistic model of an elected official. No one wants to lose their job. I don't want to lose mine. And so a model of housing reform that involves someone periodically walking the plank uh, and giving up their career is probably not going to uh, get us where we want to go. And so this, this brings me all the way back to, to what my point is, which is that part of the issue is that um, we have devolved regulation of, of housing in the United States down to the local and sometimes the sublocal level. Um, and there's often good reasons for doing that, right? I mean, this is um, the, the, the great advantage of devolution is that at the local level, you are more in tune with what people want, right? You can go all the way back to John Stuart Mill's principles of political economy, where he says, you know, national governments are great, but their one big advantage is a disadvantage, is an inferior interest in the result, right? That the president cares less about Cleveland than the mayor of Cleveland. Uh, the problem is, at that level, what you've done is you've aligned the government's incentives with all these cognitive biases that devalue the future and devalue outside people, right? And so the path to reform is probably to push some of that regulation back up to a few more levels of government. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to align the incentives of the elected officials such that they can actually push for 
deregulation of the housing market, more supply in a way that doesn't cost them their job, right? Because more people who are, will be voting for them might be people who want to live in some of these high opportunity exclusionary communities. And, and I think California is getting that way. There are right now uh, four bills on the governor's desk, um, and he has been asked to veto each one of them, um, that if he signs them would sort of comprehensively move uh, authority over housing away from local governments and to the state. Um, and I, you know, fingers crossed, uh, but I think that's a, a sort of one of the lessons from a mature market like California uh, is that, you know, when housing is first built, it's much less controversial because no one lives there, right? Uh, but as you have to redevelop, you start impinging on what people consider their sort of their habitat, um, and they become very protective of it. And so getting that structure right from the beginning uh, where, where the, the, the authority to allow new housing to be built is, is taken away to some extent, it, it seems unfair, uh, taken away to some extent from the people who are right there can sort of lock in sort of the welfare uh, of future generations and prevent these sort of fairness conflicts. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thanks. I want to talk a little bit more on top of Mike's uh, point of this uh, fairness and the relationship between kind of central or state government uh, higher level government and a local gov uh, local level uh, lo uh, lower level government uh, in the China's context just give you a story of the a tale of two cities. I will be quick. So yesterday uh, Vernon told us a story of a tale of two cities in Africa. So I'm doing one uh, another one of a tale of two cities in China. So that's resonate uh, a little bit with uh, Mike of this um, fairness and people always, when they think about this and when they evaluate whether it's fair or not, they tend to think about the people around them and the people they want, the people similar. And, uh, and then that's basically uh, generate some different understanding of the fairness and how to think about that. And uh, then here in California, in the United States, the community is really very powerful. And uh, as you know, it's very decentralized, uh, just now Mac mentioned. But in a country like China, it's not like that. And the communities, they are weak. And the citizens, they are weak. They, they cannot voice their opinions, and they cannot voice this, uh, uh, like the uh, uh, NIMBY uh, phenomenon was not that big there. However, the local governments, they are very powerful. The city governments, they are very powerful. And they also have their opinions, and when they form, design their housing policy, they are very clear what kind of people they want, what kind of uh, housing policy they want to use as a tool to attract the labor they want. So that's kind of my story. So, so that's also linked to this uh, uh, efficiency and the fear. I just want to show this pie another time. And this pie means efficiency and, uh, and equity issues. And as I mentioned at first, China was uh, in a housing shortage uh, back to 1980s before that. And then they established housing market very fast. The golden age of the real estate market in the past 20, 30 years, they built a lot of housing by developers, by the private sector. Then it's, it's no longer shortage and a lot of uh, supply. And, uh, and then it became a new problem, which is the fairness and the, and the equity problem is the poor people. They were very angry because they couldn't afford the market rate housing. And the poor people, local poor, and the rural migrants who came into the cities, then they cannot, fit. They cannot uh, afford. So they live in slums or informal housing. We call it urban villages there. And then the central government understand that become a threat. That become a big threat to the social, social stability of the, of the society because the poor people, they were angry about housing affordability, they couldn't afford, and they protested. And then although they are not very powerful, but they protested uh, on street or <laughs> on social media, that's a big pressure. And then the central government said, okay, now it's time to address this equity issue. Let's build more affordable housing for the poor and for the rural migrants. And then central government said, okay, we have a goal, five-year plan. Five-year plan, very popular, everything they have a five-year plan. Five-year plan, 30 million housing units in five years. We must supply new 30 million housing units for 
poor, low-income people. And then they have this goal and the number, and then they don't, they don't have resources. They just allocate this, uh, this quota to provinces, and provinces are allocated to cities. And then the cities, okay, you must do this. The city mayor, you must do this. Otherwise, you cannot get promoted. That's a promotion criteria. You cannot get promoted. They have this. You have GDP goal. You have this uh, a number of affordable housing built in five years. And then the cities, the city governments, the city leaders in China are very entrepreneurial. They are powerful. They have resources. And they, they are very entrepreneurial. They understand how to do this. They can, they can fulfill that goal. And then as in the meantime, they achieve their own uh, objective to attract the people they want to use this tool. Anyway, uh, I need to build so much. But the central government, they won't come here to really, really uh, monitor or really, really evaluate what kind of um, uh, people get into those units. I'm going to design my own uh, policy. So that's two cities. One is Shenzhen, the other is Chongqing. I guess many of you have been to those cities. So for Shenzhen, it's very famous. Many of you, you know. Shenzhen is now like very developed, relatively uh, relatively developed city in the uh, on the coast, very close to Hong Kong. And at first, they need a lot of low-skill labor because they are manufacturing, they export. And then now, they're in the transition to the high-skilled, upgrade to the, to the high-skilled and knowledge-based economy. They no longer need those rural migrants as low-skilled workers in the factories. And then they say, OK, I need to build this, um, the city mayor said, said, I need to build so many units. I'm going to use this for college graduates. And for those who have a college degree and come to my city, I will provide this affordable housing unit to you as a way to attract these high-skilled talents into the city. So there, there's the uh, Shenzhen strategy. And for Chongqing, it's totally different. It's in the uh, hinterland, and they're still manufacturing uh, very dominant, very important. And they say, OK, anyway, I need a lot of labor. I need a lot of labor. So I'm going to build those housing units. And then I will provide those units to these uh, workers, uh, labor, these um, rural migrants. So I don't, uh, we don't require hukou. Hukou is the status you have to have for local. And I, we are not going to check your income status, no matter what. If you come and if you find a job in the factory, this is a housing unit for you. So that's totally two different stories. And then it's, uh, it triggers the fairness uh, conversation, especially for, Chong, for Shenzhen's case. In the 20, last 20, 30 years, they, at that time, they needed these rural migrants. They, the city said, OK, you can, you can stay and can live in the slums, uh, urban villages, and uh, low, low, low quality housing because we needed you. That's a lower cost that contributes very lower production cost for these uh, toys and, uh, and uh, manufacturing goods, shoes. That's a way to lower China's urbanization cost in the past 20, 30 years. Now, we don't need you. you we, we are going to demolish those informal housing. Bye-bye. You can just go away. Now I need college graduates. I'm going to provide to these college graduates because they need them. Uh, so then it's a big debate. Is this fear or not? How about think about the, the past, the current, and the future? The Chongqing's case, OK, we like you. <laughs> Come. And uh, this is all the housing. And they even use this as a tool to attract these big firms. Say, come here, the manufacturing firms, companies to say this. If you come here, we provide so many affordable housing for free, and you can house your workers. That's a way. So they turn this housing policy into a way for productivity. And then that's a lot of debate. So that's my a tale of two cities story. I think that's wrestling a little bit with Mike, but it's, it's a different political system and the, with a powerful mayor and the, how they just uh, do the tricks and the change the policy in a way. Quantitatively, they meet the criteria. Quantitatively, that's different. Thank you. One of the things that was striking me in Mohammed's presentation was the list of housing deficits by country. And numbers that struck me was 22 million for Nigeria and 2 million for DRC. Okay, DRC is 45% uh, of the population of Nigeria and it's a much poorer country. So why does it have only 1 11th the housing deficit that Nigeria does? That just, I mean, maybe there's an 
maybe this is more comment than question, but do you have any insight into why those housing deficit numbers are what they are? Because it really is important to measure this right in the first place before we, to figure out the policy that's going on. And the other thing, just a, a comment on Jay's talk is, you know, two to three trillion over 10 years sounds daunting, but I was, so that's two to 300 billion a year. I was looking at Africa's GDP as a continent and it's about, it's a little under three trillion. And so you think about it, that's like six, seven percent of GDP to housing. That should be doable, right? That's not extraordinary. In fact, it's sort of common in terms of, if you look at new construction relative to GDP. In China, it was much higher than that for a while. So I'm just reactions to those comments. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. Um, from my perspective, the aspect of um, you know, uh, housing deficit and all the data related to it is the lack of capacity in terms of even measuring the depth and the how enormous the challenge is, which I, th I believe uh, there will be a, a presentation on that. The, because if you don't, first and foremost, understand the extent of the deficit and what needs to be done, then first, you can't even plan. So, so that's why most of the figures relating to housing deficit across Sub-Saharan Africa are estimated. And there's a lack of appropriate capacity to measure these differences and also to measure the movement and to break it down in terms of the various countries and also track you know, what is happening in terms of organization. That's an area of really consideration. And um, there are efforts being made by, by several governments but through the statistical uh, units to capacitate you know, and to enhance it, but more needs to be done. And I've always been saying that is if you don't have the data, you don't have the facts, you don't have the numbers, then you, you can't be able to plan. More specifically, a region like Sub-Saharan Africa that is rapidly urbanizing and, and there's a lot of movement uh, coupled with climate change issues and other related aspects. So, so it's just a matter of um, uh, enhanced capacities to measure these uh, def deficits and of course that informs policy making going forward. Measurement, you know what, is important. Uh, I say that uh, the numbers, for example, that uh, 50 million back, you know, well, well, it's a guesstimate, uh, really. Uh, if uh, one is to do a really proper, in-depth, you know, uh, census, uh, you would realize, you know, that there's a serious, you know, uh, undercount, you know, uh, here in terms of what uh, the deficit, you know, uh, is. Okay. But even with uh, that, uh, 50 million, you know, uh, number where one estimate, you know, uh, uh, is that over a 10 year period is going to cost uh, in the neighborhood of uh, at least uh, two trillion, you know, uh, uh, dollars to deliver. Okay. Now, if you think about this in the context of other challenges facing, you know, uh, the continent, uh, I don't really see this happening within, you know, uh, that 10 year, you know, uh, uh, period, which, you know, uh, goes back to the point that I made about the need for real leadership, real political you know, uh, leadership. We have a situation you know, uh, now when you look at uh, the land you know, uh, market, the role that is played you know, uh, by you know, uh, the chiefs. And they're going to continue, and they are, are sub-chiefs, to push you know, uh, back in terms of when land should be allocated, when should you know, what people are, are built, uh, paying attention to really the system uh, uh, itself. So that is why, uh, to me, it is quite important that the limited amount of capital that the continent you know, uh, has, it has to be utilized in an even more judicious and efficient you know, uh, way compared to what we have you know, uh, uh, now, where it is this indiscriminate starting of building, basically burying you know, uh, uh, capital, that most likely, most of them are going to stay you know, uh, that way at a stretch you know, uh, capital that is lying there fallow, is subject to erosion and destruction. And I think very importantly, what it does is uh, to de-link the housing sector with the rest of you know, uh, the economy. Okay. What is happening? Well, the house is not you know, uh, completed. So possibly the job growth you know, uh, uh, there is missing. Possibly the uh, 
advent, you know, of other segments within, you know, the economy for finishing, you know, whatever it's not, you know, are, are there. So it's sort of a multiplier, but in a backward, you know, direction, a negative, you know, direction. On the other hand, you go also, you look, there are some really high-grade houses that are being, you know, are built. Okay? Because uh, the various countries have not been able that much to support what is, you know, uh, in place, even this really high-end, you know, uh, homes, uh, I'm not sure about the extent, you know, uh, to which cities have, cities have been able to capitalize on the value of that, you know, uh, asset that could also, you know, uh, be used to upgrade, you know, uh, the infra, you know, uh, structure. So the vicious cycle, you know, uh, uh, continues. That's why I really believe, you know, uh, that we need to go back to the drawing, you know, uh, board and look very carefully at these five uh, segments, you know, that I, I think we all talk, you know, about in various, you know, uh, our, our way, because they have to connect, okay, because there's a feedback, you know, uh, loop that goes from one system to, you know, uh, uh, the other, and failure to really come up uh, with a system that sees it, you know, uh, uh, this way, well, I think it's going to be a long, long, you know, uh, uh, time before we get back you know, on the track of trying to uh, attack you know, uh, this backlog, which I believe is actually an underestimate. I wanted to pick up something that you raised, Mike, about your recommending that we raise the, regu the, the sphere of regulations to national um, or federal, state, yeah. state, okay, state. Um, and I, I worry, because I don't, I don't know if, if wisdom is particular to sphere, and, and that changes a, across the board, and it may work in certain juris jurisdictions. I wonder if we might think a little bit about the application of the way in which the sustainability and green environment is being considered. How do you argue for that around the problem that you're raising? And if we think about the future as a person, so we, we create the future person as part, of the, as part of the regulation mandate. Um, and if we do that, how, how do you stick that in? And how do you convince an official to represent the future as much as they represent me? I, but if you, one way in which we would facilitate that would be through our projections and the way in which we use the data and good data where we really understand what, what looking backwards created and project that forward to identify what are the costs and that those costs extend not only to low-income households who remain unhoused, but to high-income households who need to confront that level of unfairness in their society and the impact that that has on a whole lot of levels, both material and psychological. Right, yes, okay, there's a lot there. Um, I think, you know, with this question of, of where wisdom resides at levels of government, I think it's, it's probably equally present or absent at any level, right? I think that the, the, the logic of uh, pushing regulation of housing up a level is not because <laughs> state legislatures are particularly wise. Um, I mean, I know some of them. Um, some are and some aren't. Um, it, 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 it comes back to an alignment of incentives, right, which is just that you can the typical state representative can, can advocate for something that would be fair and efficient and uh, have less risk of, of, of uh, losing their job, right? Be, and I think this gets to a little bit your second question. You know, if you're a real long-termist, um, I don't know that there's a, a, a good answer in today's policy apparatus for this. Like, how do we make people think about 60 years from now? No one has any incentive to do that, right? I mean, it's on a sort of career-based level. Um, where the incentive aligns a little bit better is, is in the sense that um, a, a future resident of Los Angeles 
in, in the sense that they might be a future resident in the next 15 years, um, has a good chance right now of living in California, right? And so the governor of California, thinking about the welfare of that person, um, will think about how it should be easier to live in Los Angeles in, in the near term, right? Because they might pay a price if someone figures out that that Los Angeles's housing policies stop them from pursuing their dream and they're mad at the governor for it or something like that, right? Again, it's a, sort of a noisy signal, but it's there. But when you get into, yeah, you know, how do we make people care about something that might happen 100 years from now? I mean, just look at the polling on climate change. No one cares, right? I mean, it's, it's not no one, but it's pretty close to no one. I mean, I, so I, I don't know what the good answer to that is. I think it, we come back to the, the business we're all in of like, yes, we try and have data, we try and make arguments, we hope they resonate, and that we can lock something in that um, is hard to reverse, right? Like a policy that's hard, once it's there, it's hard to reverse. But I don't think what I'm talking about of just pushing the level of regulation higher, I, I think it would do a lot of good for sort of near-term housing markets, but if we're talking about 100 years from now, it's it's, it re that really is just a tough challenge. Thank you. Thank you.